speaker, I'd like to introduce Barbara Take. Barbara is gonna join me on the screen. Uh, Barbara Take is a public historian who has since 1999 researched, written about, and advocated for the preservation of the Tule Lake Concentration Camp site. She serves on the board of the Tule Lake Committee, co-authored Tule Lake Revisited, a brief history and guide to the Tule Lake Concentration Camp site, 2001, 2012, uh, also author of Legalizing Detention, Segregated Japanese Americans, and the Justice Department's Renunciation Program, 2005, and co-authored with historian Roger Daniels, America's Worst Concentration Camp. Thank you, Barbara, for joining us. Thank you, Adina. Thank you for having me. Yes. So I'll take it away, huh? Please do. I'll start out. Uh, well, I'm calling from Sacramento, uh, which is the ancestral home of the Nisinen, uh, Maidu, Miwok, and Wintun people. And uh, I want to thank the program organizers for inviting me uh, to, uh, they've asked me to give some context to Mr. Inoue's Tule Lake Diary um, to talk about how Tule Lake was different from the other nine camps and how it wound up as the only camp with a stockade uh, that, that Mr. Inoue writes about, as well as multiple car, uh, carceral sites. So Tule Lake started out the same as the other nine camps until months after opening the camps, the government decided it wanted to start emptying the camps. And the tool they used was this loyalty questionnaire. Um, the process was called registration, and people who were 17 and older were told that they had to answer this questionnaire, which was a misguided, incompetently administered bit of theater, um, and this, the, the, it was used to uh, show that Japanese Americans were loyal, not the fifth column subversives that the government claimed uh, earlier that uh, this was the argument that was used to justify the mass incarceration, that everybody was so dangerous. So uh, the loyalty questionnaire was the tool the government wanted to use to reverse what they start, they set in motion. So um, at, at camps like Minidoka and Amachi, things went smoothly because the administrators were more competent. They were less authoritarian and they handled the situation so much more humanely. But at Tule Lake, mismanagement of this whole questionnaire caused major resistance. Uh, first of all, the army got there a week late. They were supposed to arrive February the 10th. Um, instead, they arrived a day before registration was supposed to start, which was they arrived on the 9th. So instead of readjusting their schedule, uh, they started registration the following day. So inmates did not have an opportunity to get their questions answered. There was a lot of confusion. Um, being told that they needed to answer this questionnaire with, without knowing what it was going to be used for um, without being able to discuss it with somebody who might be able to give them any answers. Uh, there was a lot of misinformation and disinformation. And the inmate worried about what, what the purpose of this was and how they would respond. So many of them complied, but many of them also felt forced and coerced, and they resisted. They refused to answer the questionnaire. So the Army and the WRA, uh, were, they were very frustrated. Uh, they started threatening 20 years in prison, $10,000 fines for non-cooperation, and what they got was resistance. Dozens of protesters uh, refused to answer the questionnaire. Um, in, in, in one block, the young men all organized and refused, and they were taken to county jails. But within days, they were released because it was not a crime to refuse to answer a questionnaire. So the county jails were not an option for the WRA. So they set up their own 
citizen isolation center near the concentration camp um, and to punish the loyalty questionnaire protest, protesters, of which there were over 100 uh, that they wanted to imprison, um, which uh, truly like became the only camp, the only WRA camp with its own citizen isolation center, which were WRA prisons that were used to punish dissidents. Uh, there was no due process there. Uh, there was no, no sentences, no charges, and nobody had any idea of how long they would be in there. Um, so the WRA also had uh, smaller citizen isolation centers in Moab, Utah, and Loop, Arizona. Um, and, uh, but, you know, they were too small for all of the protesters at Tule Lake. So Tule Lake got its own citizen isolation center. So uh, because of this bungled registration process, Tule Lake wound up with approximately 4,500 so-called disloyals. Um, and mainly uh, there were so many because uh, of the incompetence of the administration. Um, Tule Lake had double the number of protesters um, when compared to the other nine camps, um, which is the main reason why Tule Lake became the maximum security segregation center to imprison dis disloyals. Um, so basically, Tule Lake became the the camp for all of the people who were being scapegoated and blamed for being the subversives and the disloyals that the, the government wanted to uh, imprison. Um, so um, under segregation, Tule Lake became the biggest and the most heavily militarized camp with a battalion of a thousand soldiers guarding the camp. So, uh, and there was a lot of movement. Um, here's some numbers. Um, about 6,000 were removed from Tule Lake and about 12,000 were moved into Tule Lake, the people who were segregated from the other camps. Um, and Tule Lake at the time had space for 15,000 people, but with segregation, it became over capacity and uh, at, at close to 19,000 people, uh, making it a very overcrowded place um, with a lot of the stresses of overcrowding um, with just, you know, too many people. Um, many of the people who were segregated to Tule Lake thought America had promised them freedom of speech and were disillusioned after being treated like criminals because they spoke out. Uh, with segregation, the WRA gathered together the organizers and the most outspoken and the, the rebellious. So on arrival, all of the newcomers began pressing for more community control. They saw Tule Lake as a mismanaged place. They complained about overcrowding. They complained about inadequate living quarters, the lack of supplies, and the quality and the quantity of food. There were labor protests. Uh, one well-known uh, strike was the coal strike, uh, you know, because the coal, coal loaders, you know, the coal would arrive in these rail cars and the men had to climb on top of the rail car that was filled with coal and uh, would have to shovel out the coal. Um, it was a filthy job, um, the, you know, it destroyed your clothing and your shoes with the coal dust. So the, the workers wanted gloves and a clothing allowance for shoes and, and pants and, and, um, and shirts because the coal dust destroyed their clothing. Um, they, had, they had to go on strike for this. Um, the major camp protest um, at Tule Lake was triggered by a farm accident in October 1943 when a truck overloaded with dozens of farm workers tipped over. Five of the workers were seriously injured and one man uh, who was a husband and father died from the accident. 
uh, the inmates were so angry about the WRA's failure to adequately assist his family and, and the safety issues that caused the accident. Um, but they also, um, they recognized they had leverage. They realized that the WRA was running a big farming operation at Tule Lake. And at the time, the crops were ripe and ready for picking, worth hundreds of thousands of dollars on the open market. And they knew the WRA was planning to sell the harvest to outside markets and to profit from their cheap inmate labor. So the farm workers organized a work stoppage. The organizers called for better safety and working conditions. They asked for better living conditions and financial assistance for the deceased man's family. And they also elected representatives from each block, modeling elective democracy. And they called themselves the Daihyo Shakai, or representative body. But Tuli Lake had just gotten a new director, a man named Ray, Raymond Beth. And Ray Beth uh, was a hardliner um, because he uh, came to the segregation center after heading up the WRA, WRA's two citizen isolation centers. You remember earlier I mentioned Moab, Utah and Loop, Arizona. Well, Ray Beth had been in charge of those two prisons for the so-called troublemakers. So he was not very sympathetic to his uh, uh, disloyal inmates who were complaining. Um, so to break the strike, he recruited Japanese Americans from other camps, paying these Japanese American strike breakers a dollar an hour. So as it turned out, the strike breakers could make more money in two days compared to what the farm workers at Tule Lake got paid for a month of work. So um, there was a lot of anger and dissent, um, a lot of organizing that was going on. And uh, the Daihyo Shakai learned that uh, the WRH director from Washington, Dylan Meyer, would be at Tule Lake on November the 1st in 1943. And so they asked to meet with him, which, you know, was an audacious move, uh, wanting to meet with the director of the WRA to press their demands for better living and working conditions. So they got their meeting, um, and uh, while they were meeting, a crowd was gathered uh, just outside of the administration uh, building, and they were waiting to hear uh, Dylan Meyer speak, address the crowd. And the crowd was estimated to be uh, over 5,000 people, like uh, just a huge community of people. Men, it was a peaceful group. It was men, women, and children who gathered, waiting. Um, but the WRA employees uh, were probably a little tense, um, only uh, a, 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 about a month before uh, there had been an uh, uh, protest and conflict at Manzanar where the MP shot into the crowd and killed two people um, and uh, wounded five people. So um, th there was a little concern about uh, the, the unrest in, in the community, in, in the imprisoned community. So um, this meeting uh, with Dylan Meyer was interrupted. Uh, by news that Tule Lake's medical director was attacked. Um, the medical director's name was Reese Petticord, um, and he was in charge of the, the camp's medical care, and he was notorious for his racism and not wanting to spend money on Japanese American medical care. So during this meeting uh, that was going on with the director, uh, Dr. Petticord was attacked by a family member, uh, a family whose baby had died. Um, the baby died of burns after Dr. Petticord refused to send the baby 
to uh, the Klamath Falls Hospital that the family had requested. And so the angry, grieving family member took a swing, just furious. He took a swing at R Reese Petticord, uh, who fell and broke his glasses. Well, this incident became, uh, it caused a commotion. Uh, it was an altercation that ended the meeting with a lot of confusion. Um, there were reporters there, um, and they wrote their stories from the point of view of the frightened white people, um, sensationalizing the commotion of the Petticord incident, calling it a riot and an insurrection, which made headlines. So uh, things were tense and at Tule Lake, and um, a, a few days later, the inmates were upset to see truckloads of food being taken from the warehouses. Um, the inmates who saw this figured it was a uh, theft. It was uh, food was being stolen to be sold on the black market, which is something that was happening not only at Tule Lake, but at the other camps as well. Um, or the other other thing they thought is that the food might be going, is, is being taken to the strike breakers. So the inmates tried to stop the trucks from leaving the warehouse area. And uh, that, that evening, Director Best's response was to call in uh, the army. There was the a battalion was poised nearby. Um, but by calling them in, uh, he put into motion martial law at Tule Lake. Uh, the, the soldiers had locked down the camp and began these barrack to barrack sweeps for troublemakers. Several men were picked up and beaten by the WRA's uh, security men. Uh, one man beaten so savagely with a baseball bat that the bat broke. I mean, if you can imagine hitting somebody so hard that you break the baseball bat. Um, it's, you know, it's the, the, the man uh, uh, was seriously hurt, um, and uh, but he was thrown into a temporary tent prison uh, called the bullpen and left to lie on the frozen bare ground. Uh, so the army um, and the WRA built a stockade uh, where all of the elected leaders and anyone else suspected of troublemaking uh, was picked up and imprisoned. And this was several hundred men. Um, and so this is the Tule Lake stockade that Mr. Inoue writes about in his diary, where uh, the place where Japanese Americans that the, uh, the WRA considered the resistance leaders and the troublemakers were imprisoned and punished. And for most of the past 80 years, um, they have been demonized as disloyal and as pro-Japan fanatics. So perversely, these racist stereotypes created by wartime propaganda dismiss the legitimacy of our community's civil rights protesters. And this is a point of view that lives on in an ocean of WRA and Department of Justice documents. The, the stories of Japanese American protest um, have for most of the past 80 years been told through the distorted lens of racist government institutions and sensationalized racist news accounts. So consider if we told the story of Native Americans from the point of view of settlers or the stories of the enslaved from the point of view of the plantation owners. That is what has been happened or that is what has happened with the Japanese American Story, which has been mostly told through the lens of the government and through collaborators. So diaries like Mr. Inoue's are just so valuable in providing a Japanese American point of view with a prisoner telling the story, 
not the jailers who saw the inmates as suspicious or violent or subversive. So Mr. Inouye's diary um, gives insight into the hearts and minds of the prisoners who saw the injustice of their treatment and they dared to speak out against their mistreatment. So um, I really just want to thank you, Kyoko, uh, for completing this labor of love and uh, translating and publishing and ensuring that future generations will know um, about your father's story and the time that he spent in the stockade. So I hand it over to you, uh, Adina, and uh, I guess we'll hear next from Nancy. Um, thank you so much, Barbara, for sharing that history with us and to give us that background. It's very helpful as we're continue our, continuing our conversation. Um, um, next, I'm actually going to introduce Kyoko Oda. Um, so Kyoko was five months old when the family left the Tule Lake Segregation Center. She was a bright light of hope for the family and its future. Her work as an educator for 32 years was followed by volunteer work in the San Fernando Valley community. She's driven in her work for the Tuna Canyon Detention Station Coalition. That is an historic cultural monument. As her four grandchildren mature, she hopes that they will continue the fight for justice. She comes to San Jose to share her book, The Tule Lake Stockade Diary with us. Thank you so much for being here. Good morning, good afternoon. I Nice to meet you and to welcome all the people viewing. I want to thank the San Jose um, Japanese American Museum and uh, the Tule Lake Committee for co-hosting this event for me. And I'd like to thank you, Adina, Chris Hioki, and Will Kaku for coordinating this event. My journey began uh, in 1970 when I was a student at UCLA. And it has become a burning desire for me to publish this book as it was unfinished business. So together with my family and support from today's panel uh, and many friends behind the scene, I am honored to bring my father's diary to you today. The Stockade Diary became a life through his words written when he was 33 years old. Next. Tatsuo uh, was a Kibe born in Laguna, California. His family returned to Kumamoto, Japan uh, when he was three years old for educational purposes. And by 1927, he had come back. And he wrote in the diary, I came back with the intention of planting my roots and raising children. Here is Tatsuo and his wife, Yuriko, my mother, and Sayuri, their first child, in Boyle Heights. Next. Tatsuo was a fourth degree black belt and taught judo in Poston before he came to the Tule Lake Segregation Center. Since he answered no to question 27 and neutral to 28, he was ordered to leave to go to Tule Lake. As you heard, the camp was falling from other no-no who were arriving at the same time from the other nine camps. He was called to a meeting on November 3rd to represent judo. The camp administrators were going to reduce the activity staff from 175 to 50. He thought that was nonsense to reduce activities at a time like that. So this next picture is actually from uh, Tomiko Yabumoto's family outside her barrack. This is kind of the weather that he experienced. He was a arrested on February, November 13th in front of my mother and two sisters, ages four and seven. As you heard, officer in charge, Raymond Best, ordered martial law, and Inoue was among those picked up right away. It was so cold in the tent that he was placed in that he wore all of his clothes and kept his shoes on, but could not keep warm. Newcomers were denied enough blankets and so he wrote that he felt dirty after days and months of confinement because soon the barracks were filled up with 200 men, making it impossible to bathe. 
next. It says here to be present, and this is what uh, my father would write some poems, and here's one of them. The snow appeared like silver from the pure heart and body that we carried. You know, he wrote about food every single day and thought about his family. And this is the view from the stockade, I'm sure. Next slide. My uh, parents exchanged letters frequently. And since he asked the guard to write in English, uh, they did not censor it. Uh, we found uh, these letters in the family house after my father passed away in the basement. Uh, you have to kind of read between the lines to sense that he was shielding her from this terrible situation. We just took a little a snippet of it. If you could go back just for a second. It says, Dear Daddy, tell me what you're doing every day. Your little girl, Sayuri. And my, my father responded, Dear children, you ask me what I'm doing. I will tell you when I get home. Next, please. So during confinement, uh, Tatsu was interrogated by the FBI several times. He wrote a summary that amazingly matches the government record. He was educated both in Japan and America, so he questioned what justice and democracy means. And he asked the FBI agent, why am I here? I want to believe in the goodness that exists in this country. I want to believe that there are good people with good judgment who believe in justice and the democratic principles. I want to appeal to such people to let them know the miserable conditions that the Japanese people are experiencing. I want to appeal to them as, member, as a member of the human race. So what happens during this period of time is his human rights have been violated. He was arrested with no charges. As you know, that is against the 14th Amendment. Men were dying from lack of medical attention, and he was heartbroken to see people die right before his eyes. He was starved, he was beaten and humiliated, dehumanized, bullied and beaten. Guards were stealing food and personal belongings. There were eight toilets of which three were not functioning for the 200 men, and he felt helpless, and most of all, it was painful for him to be separated from his family and all of them felt the same way. So they had to do something most difficult. So on December 31st, Nen signed a pact that until we are all released, we will embark on a hunger strike. Despite Tatsuo's ability for self-control, he expressed his rage towards the men in charge. There have never been such foolish men. There have never been such arrogant men. There have never been such ignorant men. There have never been such shameless men. There have never been such cruel men. On the fifth day of fasting, he wrote, my physical strength is gradually dwindling, but my spirit is not weakening. Gathering the strength to write is getting harder, but I will continue to write until the very end. His heart sank as the men were giving in to hunger. So several days later, on January the 10th, 1944, my mother wrote to him, she was curious because he hadn't written during the period of the hunger strike. She said, are you ill or something? I felt very lonesome without you. I think Masako dreams of you all the time because when she gets up in the morning, she says, I saw daddy with the soldiers. She thinks it is real. Masako is a little girl there, age four. Sayuri is age seven. And that's my mother in the picture. All of a sudden, my father stopped writing about the food he was eating and was deep in thought. To my surprise, 
he was able to forgive his fellow inmates, his jailers, and America. He said that he finally understood the philosophy book he had been reading, Saikontan, The Roots of Wisdom. Here's one of the quotes. It says, you should, if you could go back, you should forgive others while others make, when others make mistakes. Thru throughout this ordeal, he was able to remain calm due to his judo training that was both physical and spiritual. He had a life of mutual welfare and benefit. Next slide, please. So this is the final entry in the diary. He was released on February 14th with no charges. And it reads, I am filled with all sorts of emotion as I headed back to camp. As soon as I was dropped off in front of our barrack, I put down the bag I was carrying and held Masako, who jumped into my arms. At the mess hall, I said, I cannot express in words my appreciation for your kind support. Thank you so much. I was deeply moved that Masako and Sayuri did not go to bed due to all of the excitement. I was home after three months and one day. This is a picture of uh, Masako uh, in 2009 on her first pilgrimage. Uh, she felt really disquieted and she returned again in 2010, 2012, and 2014. Next slide. She suffered from post-traumatic stress for 70 years and was able to do her best work molding her memories into clay using barbed wire, paper, and wood. Next slide. She began to work day and night in her cold garage, creating her most compelling works of art. This composition is inspired by her nightmares. You know, it takes time to create, to fire and assemble. No words can describe how she must have felt. Oh, she made this piece. Since we self-published, we selected this art piece for the cover that represents our family. My father's in the back, my two sisters in the front, and my mother is carrying me. Behind us is instructions to all Japanese people. Next slide, please. It is an oversimplification to say that Tulians are disloyal or troublemakers. It is time to end the discrimination of the no-no. The WRA used food as a means of power, while on the other hand, the stockade inmates used food as resistance. The men wanted all to be released, not just some. So the hunger strike was an act of sacrifice to make a point since they had no other bargaining tool. My father was not able to take a picture of me as a baby in Tule Lake, but he wrote this upon my arrival. At this moment, no one knows when the war will end, and there is no time more crucial than today for people in the family to unite as one and cooperate in harmony. Therefore, I give this baby the name Kyoko. Bringing this book to light has changed my life. My father continues to guide me to be strong, to be truthful, and to fight for the freedom of all people. Thank you. Oh gosh, uh, Kyoko, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, I really appreciate you being here and sharing something that's so incredibly personal. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Hiroshi was Hiroshi was born in Topaz and passed through Minidoka, Ellis Island, and Rower before arriving at Tule Lake at six months of age. After his parent, after his parents spent a tumultuous two and a half years at Tule Lake. Uh, where they renounced their U.S. citizenship and were refused 
released back into America, the family, which now included a younger sister, was sent for continued incarceration six months after the end of the war uh, with Japan to the last remaining American concentration camp at Crystal City, Texas, where they were held and finally released in September of 1947, two years after the war officially ended. In 1996, Hiroshi became a member of the Tule Lake Committee. In 2004, he became the chairman of the Tule Lake Pilgrimage Planning Committee. In 2006, he also became president of the Tule Lake Committee Board of Directors. He is also currently co-chairman of the Crystal City Pilgrimage Planning Committee and president of the board of the Japanese American National Library. Thank you for joining us today, Hiroshi. Thank you for the great introduction. <laughs> um, I want to start with uh, my small collection of uh, photographs that I have of uh, Inoue Sensei, and uh, actually the first uh, one uh, is uh, <clears throat> with two of, two of his daughters, uh, my sister and I. Uh, when we were released from Crystal City in no, uh, November of 1947, uh, we went directly to the Inoue House uh, in Boyle Heights. And this picture was taken there uh, with uh, me on the right, Kyoko next to me, my sister Michi uh, next to her, and Masako at the end. Um, I remember that, uh, that trip there, and uh, I had a very clear... Uh, remembrance of, of that backyard uh, of that house and how far it went back. Um, I remember how great it was for me to see uh, Inoue Sensei again. I, I don't have any specific um, memories of, of him at Tule Lake, but what I do remember is that uh, uh, when I I uh, saw him uh, in Los Angeles at this time in 1947. Um, it was with a, a great fondness and uh, a great uh, a memory of, uh, of his warmth and uh, intelligence. <clears throat> uh, next photo. And then uh, we came to San Francisco and my father uh, began uh, the Hokubei Mainichi newspaper where he was the uh, Japanese section editor and editor-in-chief. And while uh, he was doing that, uh, in always sense, I would visit him from time to time. And uh, this was one of those times and uh, uh, they stood in front of our house and took a picture. And then I snuck in there and uh, inserted myself into the photo. Uh, I guess they call that bombing now, but I had no idea that that was a concept at that time. Next photo. Uh, this is from the same day, but it must have been taken with a different camera because its uh, quality is so much different. But uh, this one includes uh, my mother, my younger brother, and uh, one of my sisters. Next picture. <clears throat> um, from uh, those early photographs of uh, uh, Inoue Sensei, uh, I, I hadn't seen him... Uh, until uh, 1957, when I went to Los Angeles with the uh, Concord Church for a convention. And uh, I remember as I was getting ready to go, I asked my father for uh, I know he says his phone number. And I said, I'll give him a call and, and say hello. So uh, when we got to uh, Los Angeles, I called him and he says, where are you? I said at the Concord Church, he says, I'll come and get you you're staying with me. So 
uh, for two days. Uh, I stayed with the Benoit family and, uh, and every morning uh, for the convention activities, he would drive me to the church. And he looked pretty much as he uh, did in those uh, 1950s photos uh, in 1957. So uh, when in 1994, I went to my first Tule Lake pilgrimage, I uh, noticed uh, this tall man, older man with white hair, uh, but I didn't think uh, much more beyond that than that he was uh, uh, an interesting, attractive uh, person. And I didn't know who he was at the time that I took this photo, but I, you know, clearly uh, it was because I, I must have thought that he was interesting. Next photo. Uh, so this is another photo of him. And uh, it was taken at the memorial service at the Linkville Cemetery in Klamath Falls. And that's his daughter to his left and his uh, son-in-law, uh, Sayuri's uh, husband, Roy. And uh, again, I, you know, I, take, I took this photograph uh, only because he was an interesting looking person. Next photo. Then, um, on the very last night of the pilgrimage, uh, <clears throat> Sasuke Ina was walking around asking uh, people if uh, they knew anyone who had studied judo at Tule Lake. And as soon as she said that, you know, things just fell into uh, place in my mind. And I knew immediately that that man that I'd been looking at was Inoue Sensei. And then uh, she, when I told her that, she, she brought him over and we spoke and uh, he, uh, it was, it was a, a wonderful experience. And uh, he was telling me that um, <clears throat> he and my father met in the stockade and right away they, um, they had the same understanding of, uh, of the world. And so they uh, talked a lot and um, they were released uh, from the stockade uh, on the same day. They were the only two that were released on that day in February, uh, 1944. But anyway, so this, this is a photograph of uh, Inouye Sensei in 1994 uh, at the pilgrimage. Uh, next photograph. Then the following year, I decided I, I'm going to Los Angeles and, and uh, visit him, uh, which I did. Uh, you can see I had some hair then. I don't now. Uh, and uh, I was clean shaven. Next photo. And that's a photo with uh, Yuriko, his wife. Okay. Uh, I wanted to speak uh, about the uh, about what what life was like for those in Tule Lake, and um, it occurred to me that the best description encapsulated description that I know of is uh, an excerpt of, from Hiroshi Kashiwagi's poem, A Meeting at Tuli Lake. Uh, and I'd like to read that excerpt now. Next. Yes, it was right to recall the directives of the War Relocation Authority their threats and lies, the meetings, the strikes, the resistance, arrests, stockades, violence, attacks, murder, arrangement, pain, grief, separation, departure, informants, 
recriminations, disagreements, loyalty, disloyalty, yes, yes, no, 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 yes, ise, nise, kibe. These are words now, but they were lived here. There were deaths and births and lovemaking in the firebreak with the warden's flashlight shining on you. Yes, and movies, socials, dances, sports, card games, and religion. Sewing classes, flower arrangement, dowel making, wood carving, beauty behind Bob wires. Recreation was big. It was encouraged. Keep them busy. Keep them occupied. Keep them sane, for heaven's sake. But a Chronicle reporter observed there are 18,000 mental patients living in confinement at Tule Lake. I think that really tells uh, the kind of madhouse people were living in at Tule Lake. It was, it was a place that was governed by rumor and gossip. And that was because the administration didn't allow a representative group to represent the people with him and his administration. So without that uh, back and forth of uh, uh, correct information, uh, people were believing rumors and gossip as, as the real news. And that's what led to uh, <clears throat> much of the, the problems that truly like, especially when um, the renunciation law became active in truly late. There was, uh, there was no, really nothing that, that uh, people could believe that uh, that was uh, official. So what they, what they believed was uh, what they were hearing from others. And uh, it caused uh, a lot of uh, anxiety and grief among uh, everyone there. Uh, I also wanted to address the uh, uh, <clears throat> the idea of, of torture, which uh, is really brought out in, uh, you know, a sense as a diary. And, you know, he, he uh, talks about soldiers actually uh, striking uh, prisoners in the stockade with the butts of their rifles, um, the prisoners being forced to stand for two hours in the snow for roll call. And, you know, that was, that was absolute torture because there's no reason why men uh, have to stand in the snow. And some of them were in guetas uh, for two hours. Uh, Kyoko mentioned the, the bathroom situation, eight toilets, three of them broken for 200 men. And there were, I think, an equal number of showers for 200 men. So in, in the uh, diary, you know, it says it talks about uh, you had to you had to wait till 2 a.m. in the morning to take a shower. 
It's about the only time that uh, it was open. He said that it was so difficult to take a shower that when he did take a shower, he could see uh, see the dirt running down uh, the drain from his body. And then the, the food, they, uh, when he was getting a tablespoon of rice a day, and they, and he describes how uh, they were never uh, supplied with uh, cooking utensils, pots and pans, and they had to really make make do with uh, small pots. And you know, there there at times they were cooking for two, uh, three hundred men. You know, and, and it began to uh, lessen. But uh, during the time that you know, since I was uh, in the stockade. It was at uh, around that 200 uh, min level. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I, I really appreciate you sharing your stories and also the photos that you shared. Those were great. I Thank especially you. appreciated your, your photo bombing one. <laughs> uh, I, I want to remind folks just to put any questions you have in the chat. Um, I know we've gotten a few so far. I have one more speaker to introduce, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. So just so you all know, it'll go a bit beyond past four o'clock, but just uh, as Chris has put in the chat, it will be recorded. Um, so you can always watch it later if you have to leave right at four. So for our next speaker, uh, Masumi Izumi is a professor of North American Studies at the Department of Global and Regional Studies in Doshisha University in Kyoto, Japan. She is a historian of Japanese American and Japanese Canadian wartime experiences, as well as their post-internment community building efforts. Masumi has been interested in bringing trans-Pacific perspectives into the study of migration and has written numerous articles on these topics, in English and Japanese. She authored The Rise and Fall of America's Concentration Camp Law, Civil Liberties, debates from the internment to McCarthyism and the radical 1960s, which is coming soon in paperback, and also contributed an article on a Japanese Canadian baseball team to an edited volume, The Subjects of Human Rights, Crisis, Violations, and Asian American Critique. Both were published by Temple University Press in 2019. In 2020, Masumi published the first comprehensive history of Japanese Canadians in Japanese, titled The Japanese Canadian Movement, The Little Known Trans-Pacific History of Japanese Migration and Activism. Uh, Masumi met Nancy Kyoko Oda and Ernie Jane Maso Masako Ishii in 2013 and learned about the World War II camp diaries written in Japanese by their father, Tatsuo Yusei Inoue. She translated a part of the diary into English as the Tule Lake Stockade Diary. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Masumi, could you turn your video on so that we can bring you on the screen as well, please? Sure, yes, sorry. I, I, I was listening to, to all the stories and I was so moved. I kind of forgot about the camera. Yeah, no, no worries. I, I feel the same. So thank you very much for, for the um, uh, kind introduction. Um, so my name is Masumi Izumi, and um, I had this honor of um, being the translator of uh, um, Tatsu San's um, uh, diary. And that was a, like a sheer coincidence um, that I met uh, Kyoko and, uh, and Masako-san in an elevator where I was just, you know, uh, that was the last day of the conference, the, ja the, um, the um, Japanese American National Museum conference on, on redress. Um, so, so that was just but it, it almost feels like, uh, you know, a sense it brought us together because Masako kind of spotted me in that elevator and she, you know, we, we didn't know each other or anything, but then she, she kind of stared at me and then they invited me to their room and then um, they told me about the diary and and immediately I thought, okay, we need to work on this together. So, um, so but I told, told this story um, about how I got to... 
um, translate the diary in the Janon um, presentation and in other places. So today I really want to focus on the diary itself. Uh, so I'm going to read um, some, some of the text uh, from the diary. But the question I would like to ask today is about this um, Japanese-ness. And so the next, oops, sorry, uh, next slide, please. So Tulu Lake, I, I think uh, we got enough information uh, to understand that the, the Tulu Lake Segregation Center was created for people who were uh, branded as disloyal or pro-Japan anti-American. And I really want to think about what does pro-Japan mean? Like, um, and is pro-Japan pro-anti-American? Uh, so, so this question of disloyalty is a very, very important question to think about. Um, and I think we already have um, a lot of information today that we need to, to, um, to, to really dig deeply into to what these people went through and, and, and what you know, and and the the meaning of this this um, idea loyalty. Next slide, please. So uh, this is the uh, how the original um, diary looks like. It's one of the photos. This was um, the entry um, from January fourth. And next slide, please. And this is a, um, an earlier one on December 18th. And he had to write in very small letters um, in some of these days because he didn't have enough uh, sheets of paper. Next slide, please. So, um, so it was a, a, um, a little bit challenging uh, to do the translation, um, but uh, I w we, we managed to do that. So I don't think we, I have to explain this slide so much, but uh, because Barbara uh, talked about uh, how the the people were this uh, this people had uh, concerns about how the, the living conditions within the camp, and then uh, the WIA national director uh, Dino Meyer visited. Uh, the stockade. And then, um, so, so next slide, please. Right. So, uh, so there was a gathering, which will be, um, uh, I will read about that, that uh, part in the, um, the, the diary on in the next slide. But right now, um, so, so he gets after the quote unquote riot happens, and then he gets picked up on, on November 13th. Okay, so so this uh, entry is uh, um, from November 18th. So this is five days after he got picked up and he is interrogated by an FBI officer. So he's asking uh, why he was detained. And then the FBI agent is interrogating him about his activities in the camps. So next slide, please. So um, I have to apologize. This, this, the text, the, the wording itself is not exactly how it appears in the book. So I think you you should definitely um, get the book. Uh, the reason is um, I I'm, I'm right now in Taiwan and I couldn't bring the book, so I was using the older uh, version of translation, which uh, is has. It's not as sophisticated as the the published version because Masa Nakagawa, wonderful editor, um, did beautiful job in editing um, the my poor English. Um, but anyway, I think you can tell the um, the meaning of, of the 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 you know the original Japanese writing. So the FBI agent is asking, uh, please tell me about the the hospital. So he's telling the story of why he was so, and why people were so concerned about the health uh, condition in, in the camp. So he answers, um, I don't know the details, but I can tell you the general atmosphere. On the second or third day after our arrival, my child suffered a tooth from a toothache. He was screaming, she was screaming in pain, so we called the ambulance. The hospital was pretty far and it was a very cold day, but the ambulance never came, so we wrapped our child and took her to the hospital ourselves. After we returned to our block, I asked my neighbor if the ambulance was always that slow, and he said to me, even when there is a patient in critical condition, the ambulance never comes, so they would not dispatch an ambulance for such a trivial symptom like a toothache. 
In fact, I heard that it was as if you were walking into death when you go to that hospital. You would end up dead being treated by a poorly skilled doctor. I know this is extreme, but from my own experience, I learned how bad the res uh, resonance feelings are. Next slide, please. In the camp, they do not feel they can trust Mr. Best. If we explain the situation to Mr. Meyer, we thought the camp life might change for the better. And the agent asked, residents don't believe Mr. Best? To promise and not follow through is worse than not promising at all. It gives everyone a bad feeling. And the agent asked, I understand. Is that why everyone was waiting for Mr. Meyer? And uh, you know, answers, yes, Mr. Meyer is a first class gentleman in America. It is a Japanese common sense that gentlemen never lie. So everyone was waiting for Mr. Meyer. The news that he was coming spread out and the whole camp went out to see him. This part of the story you already know. Some were there carrying babies, some women were pushing buggies, and there were ma many old people. It was so merry, it was just like a picnic. Next slide, please. As I watched the situation, something occurred to me. If one young man makes violence, others will follow. I don't like violence. The Japanese just had ordinary demands, that's all. I didn't think that the camp authority had any reason to deny their request. I thought that a calm discussion would solve the problem. But if someone created a commotion, then I thought that the honor of the great people, Dai Kokumi, do you understand? The honor of the great people will be, would be tainted. I practice judo. In case such violence occurs, I am duty bound to stop it. I must preserve the honor of the Japanese. So I went to the entrance of the building. I was standing facing the crowd with the door right behind me. Then somebody said, come, come in. I looked behind and the door was closed. A moment ago was open. I, I entered as if I was sucked into the building. So he was not part of the Daihyo Shakai, but he actually goes into the meeting with the Daihyo Shakai and, and uh, Mr. Meyer. I actually feel um, like uh, an outsider. The Japanese there also stared at me, wondering what I was doing there. But since I was there already, I gathered myself together since I am a judo practitioner. I sat down on a chair without showing fear. I decided that I would listen to the representatives and if they didn't discuss the conditions of food in the hospital, which I was most concerned about, I thought I would speak up and explain it to Mr. Meyer. FBI asked at the time, did you sign the attendance sheet? Yes, I did. Ah, that's why they, picked, uh, they put you into stockade. I only signed the roster. Then I was arrested without any investigation and I have been detained for many days. This is outrageous, don't you think so? That I cannot answer. Next slide. The reason why I signed the paper is because Mr. Meyer is an American gentleman and I am a Japanese gentleman, so I signed it. Do you understand my feelings? Do you understand Japanese politeness? I understand. So Mr. Inoue, could you go back? Is feeling responsibility to protect his family, of course, but also his community, and also he's protecting this dignity of a person and a Japanese person. And he's almost um, in many places in the the diary. He's urging people to 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 keep their dignity, even at the worst condition and the the, the time of the most hardship. So he's trying to protect his nation. And so the question is, is this being disloyal to America? Um, so the Japanese-ness in his, his mind is to be a good and honorable human being. And so I'll, I'll, I will um, introduce another, another example. Next slide, please. So this uh, entry is uh, from February 1st, 1944. So the hunger strike is defeated and he's um, much more reflexive on, on 
in, inside uh, himself. Um, being over 30, I reflect on myself deeply. I am a person who always thinks ahead. It would be okay at first if there is one or two people who know that the Japanese are trustworthy and that working with us will lead to prosperity through my way of working. More, uh, if more people realize this from 5, 10 to 100, there, that is what I hope will happen. Easy solutions should not be allowed when we think about the Japanese soldiers dying on the battlefield. What is urgently needed for the Japanese in the US is training our minds and spirits so that we would not embarrass our compatriots. So he's also sending, uh, exchanging many pictures with his family and he's uh, also you know, um, kind of instructing how his family should behave in this very difficult situation. So he's asking his family to persevere, but also he's showing hope. So uh, he's giving sort of instructions to his wife. Uh, you should keep your mouth shut. Rumors generate misinformation. My records are good. In the near future, we can get together. So please do not worry. Do not forget that I am not the only person in this situation, but there are many like me. Please remember you are a human being who always has pride. I came to a new room and it's quiet and clean. I hope to learn and strengthen my health through this experience. When I get back, it might be a good thing for us to have a feeling like a newlywed couple. And uh, you should really read the diary because towards the end, there is a lot of, he's, he's very austere as you can tell, but he's also very, very cute. So um, yes, uh, I hope you get the chance to read his, his own words. The next slide, please. So this is the, uh, after the photo taken after the war. The next slide, please. And so again, I just want to, to throw this question, what does this lawyer mean? And next slide, please. I'll just go to my conclusion. Um, so the Jews, so the, in, in always says there was a judo master and he was a man of pride and a sense of responsibility. He shows this uh, through his, his words, but also his deeds, uh, his responsibility for his family, his community, and his race. I don't know if that's the, the appropriate word to use, but his nation, his race, means of clue, but also his as a human race. Um, and he always identified himself and his daughters as himself as Japanese and his daughters as Japanese descent and taught himself and his family to live up to that identity. And the next uh, conclusion is the Japanese men men ness meant dignity, self-discipline, humility, and caring for others and the community. So you shouldn't be thinking about yourself, but to uh, about the bigger world. And he's also, he also shows respect for Americans in the way he described uh, Mr. Meyer. Mr. Meyer, I'm not saying he was a, a, a gentleman, but he is saying that, um, that you know, the, the, when anyone has virtue, regardless of, of race, that person um, deserves uh, respect. So uh, next slide, please. So this is a photograph um, uh, we took uh, Masako-san and um, uh, Anansi-san at that time, uh, Kyoko-san, and uh, my daughter and me at um, Kyoko-san's house when we were, um, I was studying this diet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I I'd like to ask to have the other speakers come and join me on the screen. Um, yeah, if you could turn on your video and then they'll pop us all up together. Masumi, are you joining us from Japan? Yes, yes. Oh, oh my gosh, I yeah, didn't yeah, yeah. realize. Oh goodness, well, thank you for joining us. I don't know what time it is there. Uh, seven o'clock in the morning. Oh my gosh, very <laughs> early. We started at 5.30. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us so early in the morning. Um, we have a couple of questions, but I want to encourage the audience, um, you know, if you have any other questions you want to ask for these 
speakers, um, it's such an incredible opportunity that we have all of you here together. And, um, you know, that is definitely for me, one of the, the positives of the pandemic is that we were, were able to bring so many folks together from different places. Um, yeah, so if you go into, for the audience, if you go into the gallery view, you can see the entire panel together in the upper right corner, you should have a little button that says view. And then it said, it should say uh, gallery. So yeah, if you click on that, you should be able to see everybody. So one of the questions that was asked um, was from James, how difficult was transcribing older Japanese language and kanji into modern Japanese? I'm guessing I guess that's I from a student. Ask that question is um, the I, I was very concerned, like what kind of handwriting we'll get, and also what kind of language, um, because I'm uh, actually American studies historian, not the Japanese studies. So, but um, he, as as you could see, he writes very beautifully. Um, and and it's very easy to read. So we we had you know some some parts well, that were a little bit um, you know a bit fuzzy and and hard to read. But most um, everything I pretty much understood. Um, so yes, yeah. And the translation was you know of course um, you know it takes time. But um, I had to really dig deeply into what he was thinking and what he meant. You know writing each sentence, I, I had to think of, you know, what, what does he mean by this? And, and I tried to bring that into English. And then Martha Nakagawa did beautiful editing. That's how it was. Thank you. Uh, another question also, I had two assistants who to uh, transcribe the handwritten uh, um, diary into, he, the guy asked my assistants to type in in the transcription and then we could work on the translation that's good that probably made it a little easier too so you mm -hmm. didn't have to do um sort of both parts of that process mm -hmm. uh, another question we got was is Tuli Lake open to the public uh, whoever wants to take that Well, Hiroshi was there most recently, um, so you might want to talk about the Park Service policies for access. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it is open. I'm not sure what uh, it is at the moment, but uh, it's generally uh, open from uh, Memorial Day to Labor. Uh, yeah, to Labor Day. Uh, it, it, you could probably uh, have access to the site if you call and they'll make uh, special arrangements uh, if you do that. But yes, uh, it is open. And uh, uh, they're showing people the new renovated uh, jail. So it's really worth uh, going. If, Thank you. Thanks for sharing. And I know there are pilgrimages that you've mentioned and that I know about as well. So um, I think those are are so important for people to be able to to visit. And um, also, I, I've heard like um, very powerful experiences in terms of uh, reflecting and sort of processing. Um, so I have. If, if I if I can add, uh, yes, uh, our our next pilgrimage will be next year. Uh, while planning for a pilgrimage this year, uh, it became uh, un really unsafe to do it. So uh, we canceled uh, until next year. So uh, if anyone is interested, uh, uh, next year we'll have our Tule Lake pilgrimage. But we are going to be doing a virtual pilgrimage this year. So we'll be announcing the date at some point in the next uh, month or two. Could someone put in the chat or, or let us know how folks could find out about those pilgrimages so that they can stay in touch? Is there an email list or a website that you can give to us? There's the Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimage site on Facebook. And uh, they keep it pretty well up to date when the pilgrimages will occur. 
Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll see if we can also get that link. And when we post the recording, um, we'll put it in the description. Um, Chris also wants to remind folks that a recording of this program will be posted on the JAMS YouTube page in a week or two. Um, and I have another question from Will. Can you talk about the difficulties in preserving the campsite? So I guess I'll take that one. Um, uh, currently, the Park Service manages um, a, a kind of a, a small portion of the Thule Lake site. Um, there are the carceral sites, the jail, the stockade, one of the stockades, that is. Um, also, the uh, citizen um, uh, or the civilian um, uh, isolation center uh, out there. It's a former CCC camp that also is preserved. Uh, by the Park Service and is also accessible um, by, uh, you know, the, it's open during the summer months. And uh, as Hiroshi mentioned, if you call ahead, you could probably arrange a, a, a tour. Um, and as far as the, the preservation of the site, um, we are fighting right now to stop a fence. The site has, uh, so there is an airfield that was put on the site of the where all the barracks are. So two thirds of the former barracks area of the Thule Lake site is uh, occupied now by this primitive rural airfield that the FAA has been um, planning to build a, a 10 foot high barbed wire top fence. Oh yes, they, they said as a concession, they wouldn't put the barbed wire on the fence. But we're talking about a three mile long fence that would destroy the fabric of this national landmark eligible site. And uh, by putting up a fence like this, it jeopardizes the future preservation of the site. It, the site would lose its integrity and so we have been fighting this fence for the last 10 years. Um, we have filed, oh, uh, five lawsuits fighting to protect the, the Thule Lake site. So this fight will continue. It, it, it is ongoing. Uh, we are currently waiting for the FAA to issue a, um, uh, an environmental impact report and an environmental assessment under preservation laws, the you know, national and state preservation laws. Uh, so we are waiting for the FAA to release these reports and there will be a public comment period in which it will be very important for our community to weigh in and to let the federal government know about the importance of the site and why it should not be developed for other uses. It needs to be protected. So uh, we will be letting you know, this is another fight like the Lava Ridge fight, um, you know, that they're fighting this uh, wind farm uh, that will be visible from the concentration camp site. So it's really, it's important for our community to weigh in um, on the importance of that site. So we will be letting people know um, uh, through uh, the, you know, Japanese American press, hopefully the broader um, uh, public media to let people know um, when this report is released and how they can most effectively uh, let the government know how important the site is to, to not only our community, but to America, because it tells the story of Japanese American resistance um, and it is the story that has been marginalized, demonized, um, kind of infused with racist propaganda. And it is the story that connects our community to civil rights protests. So it's very important that people in our community especially weigh in. So we'll keep people posted. Thanks Thank for the you. question, Will. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Barbara. I really appreciate that. And I, I completely agree. I think it's it's so important that um, that people understand what perspective the history is coming from. 
Um, Will says, by the way, on the Den Show site, I believe that they wrote about an inmate who was killed by a guard and was fined one dollar. Can you confirm? That's not a true story. Okay. All right. And thank you for that. And um, so you know what? I'm so sorry, but we are running out of time. I, I just want to acknowledge that for Eileen's question, um, we will send out that information, but also Lorna wrote in the chat that you can go to the website tulilake.org, click on the tab that's labeled pilgrimage for updates on pilgrimages. And then also that the Tule Lake Committee, as was mentioned, has a Facebook public group called Tule Lake Pilgrimage. So um, thank you, Lorna, for that information. Um, I want to bring our program to a close first of all by thanking all of you so much for coming to speak to us and to share your stories. Um, I know that 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 these can be very difficult to share and um, I just it, it takes a lot of uh, bravery so I have a lot of respect for the work that you all do and and thank you for coming and being here with us.